is Islam compatible to the modern age. Many people are talking about Islam versus Christianity or Islam versus Judaism or other religions. However, I do believe that the real challenge that Islam is facing these days is not the other religion, but the challenge of modernity or the challenge of secularism or the challenge of liberalism. That is the real challenge. We see that some Muslims are developing their own version of Al-Islam, and that is the real challenge. In alhamdulillah rabbil alameen wa salatu wa salam ala khayru al-anbiya wa mursaleen amma bad assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh alhamdulillah we're here again for another session of this wonderful peace conference and uh, we like to uh, praise our creator Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who has given us this beautiful religion of al-islam I'd like to take the time now to introduce you to our speaker, Sheikh Haytham Al Haddad, who will be speaking on Is Islam Compatible with Modern Age? Sheikh Haytham Al Haddad is a London based Islamic scholar and a prominent Muslim community leader. He was born and raised in Saudi Arabia and is of Palestinian origin. Sheikh Haytham sits on the board of advisors for a number of key Islamic organizations in the United Kingdom, including the Islamic Sharia Council. He currently holds the position of chairperson and operations advisor for the Muslim Research and Development Foundation, a think tank aiming to find solutions based on the original teachings of Islam for Muslims living in the West. The website for that is www.islam21c. Com. He has studied for a number of decades and gained proficiency in many Islamic sciences under the tutelage of world-renowned scholars. Sheikh Haytham holds a BSc Honours in Law and Sharia from Omdurman University in Khartoum, Sudan. He also holds a BSc in Computer Science from the King Fahad University of Petroleum and Minerals in Saudi Arabia. He is currently pursuing his PhD in Islamic law at SOAS in London. Sheikh Haytham is qualified to deliver religious verdicts with a specialization in Islamic jurisprudence and its principles, Islamic law and Islamic finance. He has edited a number of Islamic books in Arabic and is in the process of completing four more books in English to be published soon. So now, inshallah, I'd like you to um, Welcome to Sheikh, inshallah, with your, your hearts, not with a round of applause, inshallah. Um, he's going to give us a talk now, which I'm sure you're going to enjoy, as I will. Assalamu alaikum for the Sheikh. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. Wa salatu wa salamu ala ashraf al anbiya wa al mursaleen. Nabiyana Muhammad wa ala ahli wa sahbihi ajma'in. Dear brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. First of all, I would like to express my deep thanks to the brothers, the organizers of this important conference, and in particular, the brothers who are working in the uh, workshops and in the ground floor. Normally people would like to express their thanks to the head of the organization, but they forget the other people anyway. Allah Jalla wa Ala knows about the other people. So we would like to also extend our thanks to those who are uh, considered to be the head in soldiers who are working or who are preparing the groundwork. Uh, 
Also, I would like to express my thanks to the Indian brothers for their hospitality. MashaAllah, tabarakallah. So, jazakumullah khairan for all of you. Uh, the topic that we are going to discuss today, I believe that it is a very important topic. It's a very significant topic that all of us need to be aware of it. And it is a little bit intellectual topic. Uh, and that's why we need to concentrate in order to understand the philosophy of this topic or the various aspects of this topic. Uh, this topic is, is Islam compatible to the modern age? Is Islam compatible to the modern age? Why do I believe that this topic is a quite important topic? Now, many people are talking about Islam versus Christianity or Islam versus Judaism, or here, many people are talking about Islam versus Hinduism or other religions. However, I do believe that the real challenge that Islam is facing these days is not the other religions, but is the challenge of modernity, or the challenge of secularism, or the challenge of liberalism. That is the real challenge. And that's why you will see that so many Muslims these days are accepting secular Islam or liberal Islam. We see that some Muslims are developing their own versions of Islam, and that is the real challenge. A Christianity, I believe that it is not anymore a challenge, and we don't want to use that beating a dead body is not really fruitful because it is dead anyway. So I believe that the distorted version of Christianity is a dead body, and we are just keep beating that dead body. But we need to face the challenge, which is the challenge of modernity or secularism, or you can say liberalism. That is the real challenge. Now, in order to face this challenge, we need to attack it from different angles. And that's why it is very important for us to understand some basic background before answering or responding to this challenge. First of all, brothers and sisters, I believe that the first thing that we need to discuss when we discuss such a topic is to define what is right, what is wrong. Yeah, what is right, what is wrong? I think this is one of the key questions or the primary questions that many of us are unable to articulate intellectual answers. What is right, what is wrong? Or who, let me put it in the other way around, who has the right to define what is right, what is wrong? Now, for Muslims, they would like to say that the one who has the right to define what is right, what is wrong, it is Allah Jalla wa Ala, that is clear. But when we face the challenge of modernity, then we are struggling, and that's why we need to be able to articulate our views. Now, when we talk about who defines what is right, what is wrong, from an intellectual point of view, we, as I said, as Muslims, we say that Allah, the Creator, the one who is above us, the one who created everything in this world, is the one who has the right to define what is right, what is wrong. However, from a secular point of view, they said, yes, the God, the Creator, has limited rights to define what is right, what is wrong, but human beings can also define what is right, what is wrong and we should give them the right to define what is right, what is wrong. Not only that, but some secular Muslims, they say that, well, Allah Jalla wa Ala gave us the authority to define what is right, what is wrong, in matters related to our worldly affairs. And this is, you can say, the philosophical or maybe the usuli background behind this idea. And all of them, they quote the hadith in Sahih Muslim, Antum a'lamu bi umuri dunyakum, you are more knowledgeable about your worldly matters. 
So how do we respond to this idea or this challenge? Now, the non-Muslims, because they don't believe in the concept of the divine, they don't believe in the concept that the creator is an external authority. And that external authority is the most qualified entity to define what is right, what is wrong. And hence, they started to develop new ideas to define what is right, what is wrong. Now, the idea that they came up with is what? The idea of democracy. Now, I don't want to take the discussion into democracy and uh, just direct the whole topic into democracy, but I would like to touch a little bit on the issue of democracy from a philosophical and an intellectual point of view. What is democracy? The idea behind democracy, for example, we are in this hall, and we said we would like to stop now or maybe to stop uh, after one hour. Shall we stop for prayer now or shall we stop for prayer later? Or the people would like to have some drinks. So let us say that we have two options, whether to have fizzy drinks or water. So who is going to decide for us? The idea of democracy said that we, as human beings, we are the people who are qualified to decide uh, which drink we should go for, fizzy drinks or water. Then we are sharing this room or this hall, so let us decide. Then how to conduct this decision? What is the mechanism to conduct or to come up with a final answer? So let us have voting. We will say, who would like to drink water? And some people will raise their hands, so they will vote for water. Some other people will vote for fizzy drinks, and then we will consider them. So that is the idea of democracy, that we decided for that. But there are problems with this approach. There are fundamental problems with this approach. Faithful servants of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Some faces in the day of resurrection will beam in brightness. Their qualities, their characteristics. Those who believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Shaykh Sayyid al Ghadi. And their hearts find tranquility and rest by remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Can we be one of them? Indeed, by remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, hearts find rest and tranquility. Welcome to a brand new series, The Servants of Allah. Hisham Bela. Which inshallah ta'ala will focus on those issues which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves. loves. Let's learn how and what gains us the favor and pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Servants of Allah tomorrow at 4.30 p.m. and repeat telecast at 3.30 a.m. India on Peace TV. is the cornerstone for a successful society. How can we maintain a successful marriage? Join us in this journey where we learn how to plan for it, execute it, maintain it, and end it according to Islam. Grasp the unique philosophy of Islam to make marriages successful 
in marriage and divorce next on peace tv first of all in any matter that we vote for we will not find 100% consensus have you ever found 100% consensus on something I'm asking you, have you ever heard of something that the whole nation agreed fully on it? And any other matter, do we have a 100% consensus? No. So there will be 90% of the people agree on something and maybe 10% will disagree with that. So shall we go for the 10% or shall we go for the 90%? Most likely we will go for the 90%. But what about the rights of the 10%? Do we neglect them? If we neglect them, then we had a problem because we have the rights of minorities. What about if there is a conflict between the decision taken by the 90% and the decision taken by the 10%? What are we going to do? How do we consult for that? 90% of the people say, for example, we should stop alcohol. And 10% of the people say, we should force alcohol these are two conflicting decisions who is going to win we should go for what this is a real problem the other problem is when we talk about a democratic approach we were talking about the people in this room there are some sisters with some children have we consulted the children some people will say but the children are not the proper people to consult Okay, the children. What about teenagers? 14 years of age, 15 years of age. Do we consult them or we don't consult them? Some people would say that we have to put a limit. Either to say above 18, he's allowed to vote. Below 18, is not allowed to vote. So still, that is a problematic because we have ignored some people by this democratic approach. This is a problem. Okay. Now, among us, there are doctors, and they know the negative consequences of what? Of fizzy drinks. And those doctors, they are more qualified to vote for this and to maybe decide on this other than the lay people. So are we going to give the doctors who are more qualified on this issue weight, more weight on this issue uh, over the other lay people, this is another problem. A fourth problem, or the fourth problem, we will have maybe, there are some people who work for companies that distribute fizzy drinks, or maybe they work for the factories that produce fizzy drinks. So they had their own agenda when they are going to vote. And they might offer the other people, if you vote for fizzy drinks, we will offer you free fizzy drinks so they will influence the decision of the mass and hence this process has its own problems of course there are other problems in terms of democracy but we are not going to as i told you we are not going to cover all the problems otherwise this will take the remit of the discussion somewhere else so the question is what is the Islamic alternative? What is the Islamic alternative? The Islamic alternative simply, and we will discuss it in detail after a while, is to say that we have an external authority. And that external authority is not biased, is neutral, is again looking for the favors of the sisters, the favors of the brothers, the favors of the young people and the favors of the old people. It is not influenced by commercial motivations or financial motivations. It is not influenced by any kind of motivation. Moreover, that external entity is more qualified, more qualified than the doctors, more qualified than the lay people, because it is the most knowledgeable entity. We give that external authority the right to legislate for us. So that is 
the principle behind Islam and how Islam approached this issue of what, of what is right, what is wrong. Now you might notice that I haven't quoted any Quranic verse or any uh, a prophetic tradition. Why? Because I am just trying to have an intellectual, rational answer for this question, who is defining what is right, what is wrong. Now, in the Quran, we say Allah Jalla wa Ala says in the Quran, in number of verses, Allah Jalla wa Ala called the Quran as the Huda, the guidance. In some verses, Allah Jalla wa Ala quoted the Quran as guidance for mankind, the whole mankind, Muslims and non-Muslims. In some verses, the Quran was quoted as guidance for muttaqeen. Alif Lam mean dalika al kitab la rayba fihi hudan lil muttaqeen in Surah Al Baqarah. But in Surah Al Baqarah again, Shahr Ramadan al ladhi unzila fihi al Quran hudan lil nasi wa bayinat min al huda wal furqan. It is guidance for the whole mankind. So Al Quran is guidance. And it is not just guidance, it is the guidance. We see in the Quran, Allah Jalla wa Ala says, In هذا القرآن يهدي للتي هي أقوى. Indeed, this Quran guides to that what is better. That what is better in everything. In our worldly matter, in our matters related to the Akhirah, in every single matter. So it is the guidance, it is the only guidance. That is simply from a Quranic point of view. And the rational argument that I have presented is actually used in the Quran. And we don't need to go throughout the verses that prove this rational argument, that argument just because of time constraints. Now, uh, the second point after establishing a fact that Allah or the Creator is the one who has the right to decide what is right, what is wrong. We have another challenge that we need to face, which is known as, from an academic perspective, is the challenge of modernity. The challenge of modernity goes like this. They say that things are changing. Technology is developing. We see new realities in our life. Now there are airplanes, there is internet, there are types of communication that were not at the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi wa So what do we need? What do we do with these new things, new realities? Shall we contextualize them? Shall we contextualize the Quran? What do we need to do? How do we face these changes? How Islam faces these changes? Now, from non-Muslims, they have the answer which is what? The answer of modernity. And that's why they have the modernity and post-modernism. Now, again from a rational point of view, how do we tackle this question? I would like all the brothers and sisters just to pay attention to the rational argument here. And as I said, I do believe that this topic is a quite important topic and these challenges that we are facing these days are more important to be understood other than maybe Christianity or Judaism because of what I said in the beginning. So please, brothers and sisters, let us try to understand the rational argument. Now, as the husband, yeah? As Allah Jalla says in the Quran, yeah? You deserve half of what your wives have left if they have no children. Okay, and then she said, if I have no relatives, okay, deserving relatives of the second half, it should go to that man. And he took a big land and he became rich because of this. Can it happen? It can happen. In another incident, that incident actually, I came across that incident myself. I visited my father in his city in Taif, in Saudi Arabia. And we went to visit some friends, and we had a Eid gathering. In that gathering, the people were extended greetings and Mubarak for a person who was 45, something like this. 
because he had a new not son brother so i said mashallah you have a new brother how old are you he said 45 46 a new brother he said yes just a few days or few weeks i said mashallah how come what is the story one of the elders who is maybe around 80 told me that his father is very very old minimum he is 90 years of age minimum he said some time ago long time ago i used to call him uncle so he's minimum 90 maybe 90 something he was ill obviously 90 something he was ill he needs someone to clean him to touch him so his children used to bring him a nurse to clean him and sometimes their wives and sometimes themselves he said it doesn't work first of all the nurse cannot touch me it is haram yeah what is the solution they said okay let us offer one of the nurses if she can marry marry him yeah so they offered one of the nurses would you like to marry this person because if you clean him touch him is haram and he will look after you and this is his house okay so they want to make stay. it halal yeah they want to make it halal she accepted she accepted okay <laughs> if i may say i don't know may, inshallah it is suitable i remember this man who was telling me about the story of his father he said when they got married the nikah he said to his father my dad be careful don't do anything yeah you know what we mean by don't do anything he said come on son come on just be quiet just go away get lost i am very old very sick do you think that i can do anything he said i'm just warning you anyway this man the one who was talking to me he said a few months later my father called me and said come on yeah we were visiting him anyway he said uh, you need to take this lady to the hospital. She feels drowsy and she fainted one time. What? She fainted? Why? She's not eating well. He said, no, 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 she's becoming big even. So he said, I took her to the hospital. And the hospital checked her and she was pregnant. She was pregnant. The man told me, I went to my father. I told him, Dad, what did you do? He said, well, I didn't do anything. He said, what? She's pregnant. He said, is she? She's pregnant. Well, you know. Okay. Anyway, oh, we are in front of audience from different age groups, etc. Okay. So, the issue is, he was 90 plus and she was might be 20 something. Can it happen? Can it happen? He's happy. He's happy. She's happy. She's happy. There is a consent from all parties, yeah? Or from the father, because we said that if the boy is young or the girl is young, the parents who are responsible, we are not talking about irresponsible parents. As we always say, odd circumstances treated differently. We are not talking about, we are talking about these and parents who will choose the best for their children. So that marriage can be valid and as we said, the father can get his son or his daughter married to another suitable person. The wisdom of the Sharia. Yes, yes, yes. Sharia deals with all circumstances. Yeah? Because it is the deen of Allah. Brothers and sisters, please join us in the next episode where we will move on to the mutually agreed conditions when it comes to the nikah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. نكاح مبارك, مبارك.